Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Anthony Lusky, Kilo 8 Zulu Tango, and tonight we're going to be talking about computers and amateur radio. This is my contact information, K8ZT at AWRL.net. I also have a website, uh, www.k8zt.com, and we'll actually be visiting that tonight because that's part of my presentation, talking about some computer resources that I have on my site. Tonight's presentation is available at tiny.cc slash arcomputer, and you can also shoot the QR code. I'll have this up at the end so you can do shoot the QR code then. We will also be publishing the PDF format of today's slideshow presentation, but... Um, as uh, you might have heard from Dan, he asked, asked me to do this this afternoon, so this is a very fresh presentation, so there may be some updates or changes in it over the next uh, couple days. So the topics for tonight, the general outline is we're going to talk about computers for amateur radio, we're going to talk a little bit about interfacing, we'll talk a little about software and online, re <laughs> excuse me, online resources, and we'll talk about field powering uh, laptops, which is often a an issue uh, when you have all the power for everything else and then you don't have power for your laptop. Well, in previous years, that wasn't really a problem, but now we've came to depend on it for so many things. So I have a picture here that's interesting. This shack has six monitors in it. I'm sorry, seven. I missed the one up here in the corner. So this guy has seven monitors in the shack. I'm not sure how many computers they're attached to. Um, the one thing that's interesting is it looks like he still has his operating position facing the radio, though. If you look at my picture here, you'll see that my computer is facing the spot that I face, uh, and my radio is off to the right because I'm right-handed in my main radio. So let's jump in. Let's first talk about some amateur radio computer considerations. We're going to talk about the ability to run amateur radio software, interfacing capability, multiple monitor capability, internet access, field operations, and possibility of multiple users. <laughs> so this gentleman's out in the field here. He has his ruggedized laptop and his, his radio there, and he's operating out in the field. I'm not sure what he's powering it with. So the vast majority of standalone amateur radio software, uh, non-browser-based applications, what we're talking about is Microsoft Windows-based. There are some programs for other operating systems and some very good programs. There's also some versions of some programs that are run on multiple platforms. And there's some web-based programs that don't care about the OS. But the majority of them you're going to find are Windows-based. Uh, so I'm going to talk mostly about Windows computers tonight, but I will talk a little bit about some other types. It's suggested that you have a minimum of Windows 8, preferably Windows 10. Um, I'm not that familiar with the Windows 11. I played with it a little bit, but I've not tested it with all the software, so I'm not ready to jump over the, the bridge yet from 10 to 11, and some of my computer equipment isn't able to run 11 anyway. Any computer that will be online needs to have current updates installed, so don't think you're going to get away with just having some old Windows XP machine or Windows 7 machine and run all your software and connect to the internet and everything's going to work just fine. I, I, Computers are not that expensive, so go ahead and update, upgrade if possible. I want to show a quick little uh, slideshow here, and I need to fix this because it's not coming up right. So just one second here. Let me adjust this slide. I see what the problem is. There we go. Okay. So a quick little video here. There's background music. I'm not going to play the background music. So they're going to look at different changes in operating system popularity over the last 17 years. We're going to increase the speed a little bit too. Notice how Windows XP is holding on to its roll of still over 60%. Now it starts dropping. And it wasn't Windows Vista that killed it. It was Windows 7.
Windows XP is over 10 years old before it drops under 10% use. Windows 10 starts taking off in 2016. Are there really people that still use Vista? And now we're up to May 2020. I'm not up to an ad. So just an idea of what the the uh, popularity of various programs have been. So the vast majority of um, new equipment. I'm sorry, I missed a slide here. Okay, there we go. As I mentioned earlier, the vast amount of the software is Windows based, but there are alternatives, both programs for Macintosh and Linux. But the other possibility is using a Windows emulator or virtualization software on your Mac or Linux computer. I know a number of people that do this just fine. So there is a way to get around that. But I find in most cases, if you're buying a computer specifically to use with amateur radio software, you can go out and buy a cheap Windows machine and continue using whatever else you want for your other computing needs. Uh, there was a great uh, presentation, though, on Linux software a couple of weeks ago from Andy's Linux distribution. So go back and watch that video if you're interested uh, on the Rat Pack uh, list. The one thing that's happening a lot, though, is we're getting a lot of browser-based applications. These really are OS uh, oper operating system uh, neutral, so they work on a variety of computers. Let's talk a little bit about interfacing. The vast majority of new equipment is using USB interfaces on it uh, for rig control, for software, I'm sorry, for sound cards, etc. But a lot of old equipment has RS-232 serial connections, and some older equipment requires proprietary interfacing hardware. Sometimes you had to install uh, a separate board inside the, the radio. Uh, sometimes it used weird connectors. Sometimes it used uh, different levels of uh, signal strength, so you would have to do a TTL to RS-232 adapter. So we're not going to cover that tonight. We're just going to say that most of them use USB. And the ones we're going to talk about tonight are the exceptions that use RS-232 serial connections. So if you have a device that uses an RS-232, you can install a serial port card in your PC. It's still very practical to do, but it's very impractical with laptops. Um, or you can use an older laptop with a true serial port. You can even buy a new what I'm going to refer to as specialty laptops with serial ports. They tend to be a little more expensive, but uh, they're out there. There are some laptops that still have true serial ports on them. What most people are going to end up doing, though, is using a serial to USB adapter cable. And uh, I strongly suggest avoiding cheap cables and or counterfeit prolific drivers. Go with a high quality cable and make sure it says it has an FTDI driver in it. You'll have much more success. You don't have to install drivers on your computer. You won't be frustrated. I basically learned over the years, if the USB cable is blue, throw it away. It's probably a cheap clone. Uh, I also like the USB cables that have the uh, toroid suppression on both ends of them uh, to help with interference. But look for an FTDI when you're searching for one of these uh, adapter cables. What I'm going to do now is we're going to interrupt for a little bit of extra geekiness, even though we always have geeky stuff anyway. This is even a little bit more geeky in some respects. The first thing I want to talk about is dealing with, dealing with COM ports. And I don't need to give this whole talk because there's already a great talk out there by N6TV. He did this for Contest University in 2020. It was a revision of one he had done uh, in 2019. And he talks about all these different topics, legacy PC serial ports, USB ports and devices, USB to serial adapters. Uh, he talks about the settings in the device manager of Windows, managing serial port numbers, uh, using serial ports for CW and other keying, sharing serial ports, and USB sound cards. It's a great presentation. It's about 45 minutes long. You can go out, click on the uh, link here if you want to read about it. He has a written version. Or you can go watch the video from his presentation on Contest University in 2020. I actually have it right here, so you can actually just click on it and view that presentation if you want. It's a great presentation. And if you don't think you need to read it, 
one of the one of the keys to reading this is if when you turn your computer on and your radio is always already on it keys your radio once makes it beep and makes it transmit for just a second that's because there's a feature turned on your serial port that you need to turn off that's one of the functions that's there and, and uh, n6 tv talks about how to easily turn that off so you won't have to worry about keying your radio when you turn on your computer there's also a good presentation by Jim, uh, a slideshow by Jim Brown K9YC, who talks about a whole variety of interfaces. And this has a lot more legacy things in it also. So uh, good information there. Um, information on sharing COM ports. I have my radio set up, my uh, Elecraft K3 here. When I'm using it, I'm actually using it with three pieces of software simultaneously using the same serial port. Uh, by using a software called win for k3 suite um, all four all three of these programs are made by the same company um, there's also another tool called null modem emulator also known as com zero com that i set it up so when I, once i do that i can assign a shared com port number to each of my devices so even though my radio is actually connected to com4 my uh, n1mm thinks it's on com17 my uh, Logic uh, soft logging software thinks it's on COM 13, and my WSJTX thinks it's on COM 19. So they're all sharing the same COM port. I also have a couple uh, videos here with information on uh, virtual audio connections. The most common is uh, one is uh, um, I'm going to forget the name of it now. Um, I forget the name off the top of my head, but uh, information on virtual sound connections. And this is a way that you can uh, send sounds on your computer over to other software. A prime example of this might be is if you're using an online software defined radio uh, that's on the internet that you can tune in, you can use the virtual audio cable to pipe that to WSJTX and have it decode the FT8 and FT4 that are there. Quite often we use a computer to send CW by keying our keying jack. And there's a number of ways we can do this in the old RS-232 of, of either using the RTS or the DTR control line. Uh, most of these little interfaces uh, use either opto isolators or transistors and diodes to isolate so we don't actually put voltage on that key. We simply key, close the key each time. So here's my favorite. It uses a little opto, opto isolator, and this is actually a dual opto isolator, so you're not using both the channels. Uh, this is set up to plug into my KX2 or KX3. Uh, it uses a serial port, but I can easily connect that to a serial port USB uh, cable and run this little interface. Here's another one using uh, transistors and diodes. Here's two more. So there's a wide variety of these circuits, and they work pretty well. Um, there's been a few issues lately uh, when you're using these with a Windows-based machine uh, or when you're using a USB adapter, sometimes you'll get a little bit of erratic uh, operation. It, DOS had no problem supporting the serial keying, but with the Windows uh, OS, there's some timing issues. So what people have done to get around that is they're using an interface called the WinKeyer. This was originally started by K1EL, although there are clones of WinKeyer-like software out there and hardware. It enables developers to create an integrated Morris code keyer within their programs under any of the Windows varieties. And what it does is it actually pushes the processing of opening and closing the keys for the characters out to the WinKey device. So it's actually keying the radio, not the computer timing. Some radios support proprietary commands to key the radio CW directly with CAT control. So for example, on the Elecraft K3, I can send uh, commands directly to the command structure of the radio, and that will key it, and that alleviates all sorts of timing problems. It also lets me send uh, F FSK by keying the radio directly by sending coded information to it. And you can do that within N1MM and other programs. Here's some examples of some of the WinKey products. The WinKey keyer, uh, the, um, the mini keyer, which is very simple. There's also a serial keyer that you use with a serial port, or you can build your own devices using the basic chips that do, that do the WinKey emulation. 
There's some other tools out there. More Ready is one of them. Uh, K3NG is a person who has created a lot of different keying software using Arduinos, and it's all open source. There are a couple manufacturers that make kits or or commercial products with his software. He's, he allows you to do that, uh, or you can build your own device using his uh, his uh, coding for Arduinos. I also have another video here on sound card interfaces. So now back to our regularly scheduled programming. I'm sure you've had enough of ports for right now. Let's talk about running monitored, multiple monitors. I'm sure a number of you probably are already doing this. It's been kind of very popular with the zooming that's going on. But I've been doing it for a number of years because um, quite often in my office, when I was working, I had a laptop and I had a monitor set up there and I'm using it. I would use the docking station as soon as I'd set my monitor on the docking station, it would give me dual monitors <coughs> and I could either clone my screen or have a second screen that I could move to so I could move applications off of the main screen and still be able to see them. Adding a second monitor can be very helpful um, or a third monitor <laughs> or a fourth monitor. Excuse me a second. <coughs> Most laptops have the ability to run at least one external monitor. Older laptops typically use VGA. Newer models uh, are mostly converting over to HDMI or this other little strange micro HDMI adapter, uh, which you might need a special adapter to plug a regular HDMI cable in. Some of them also have HDMI and VGA, although I'm seeing less and less with VGA as time goes on. You can also use adapters to convert to whatever mode you want. Um, as I mentioned earlier, docking stations are another way to go where you simply pop the laptop into the docking station and it gives you multiple uh, video out ports on it. It also allows you to add additional USB connections, which you might run out of very quickly if you're using it with your station. And some of the, the, monitor, the uh, computers have very inexpensive um, docking stations. There are also USB driven monitors available. So if you don't have a port that you can use or you've already used your first port to run one video device on your laptop, you can add a third device by using a USB driven uh, monitor. When you're running multiple programs, maps, charts, etc., it can eat up a lot of your screen space. On desktops, you can add an extra video card or a card with multiple video ports on it. I have a card that supports uh, HDMI, uh, VGA, and, DV and uh, DVGA. Uh, so I have three ports and I'm running three different monitors on it. Having HDMI will let you use inexpensive larger LCD TVs uh, in addition to traditional monitors. Although some of them are not great for re doing text, they're fine to have above your head or off to the side with a big map on it or a geo clock or if you want to run something along those lines. Uh, you can pick up a 40-inch a, a monitor very inexpensively now uh, when you're buying a cheap TV. I have a whole uh, I have a link here. Anytime you see this little link sign and this font, that means you can click on it and go out to a link. This particular link is from Microsoft telling you how to set up multiple monitors in Windows and the difference between cloning and uh, having different types of, of displays. You can also change the, the uh, refresh rate on each of the displays depending on how your computer is set up. Internet access has become pretty much a necessity for most uh, amateur radio operators because we're using it for multiple things uh, such as uh, DX cluster spotting. Uh, we might be using it for um, checking out propagation via PSK report and other things. So at home, it's not much of a problem. There's usually a wide variety available unless you're like Dan and you live in Idaho and he has to tie a string out to a pole outside of his house and they come by and dump internet at once every hour at his house. Uh, so that's why he's always going, that's why he's always turning his camera off, by the way. That's when the internet's not working there. No, actually, I think he has satellite there. But when you're out operating portable, your operates, your options for internet can go great, greatly decrease. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a good a cellular provider that gives you unlimited data and you have good coverage, you can set up a cellular hotspot with your phone or a dedicated, uh, that should say, dev yeah, dedicated device. Uh, you can buy a hotspot device and uh, you can set that up. I notice a lot of the 
the internet providers are now advertising that's the primary way that they're going to provide internet to you is through a software device in your house that actually creates a hotspot if you're going long distance uh, i'm sorry for shorter distances you can use long distance wi-fi links either via mesh network or point-to-point -point high gain antennas so because we have access to some of the Wi-Fi channels as amateur radio operators, we can expand beyond the, the normal uh, limitations of Wi-Fi by increasing signal and using high gain antennas if we do it within the amateur portion of the band where those Wi-Fi things are located. So if you're only talking about a short distance, a couple of thousand yards or something like that, or maybe even a mile or two, you can set up a Wi-Fi link and save yourself the cost of a hotspot. Sometimes when you think you need internet access, you really don't need internet access. What you really need is to be able to do time synchronization. A couple years ago, we went to Delaware and stayed in a cabin for field day, and I was operating WSJTX uh, a little bit during field day, but quite a bit during the week after because a lot of people wanted to work Delaware. It was fairly new mode. The problem was my laptop, because we didn't have internet at the cabin, would keep, kept drifting time. Fortunately, I could drive about five miles away, go through the McDonald's drive through order a milkshake, sync my, synchronize my laptop to their Wi-Fi and get my time synchronized, go back and then operate WSJTX for about two days that I had to return. Well, I could have easily uh, did away with that McDonald's trip by getting something like this little USB drive, which I did. This is a US, UB, USB GPS, and that's all that's needed for the time standard. The bad news was, though, no milkshake, so I'm not sure which is better. You know, taking the time out and going, getting the milkshake or having the ability to do it right there at the cabin. If you only need peer-to-peer -peer networking, in other words, for example, let's say at your field day site, you want to use N1MM network between all the operators. You don't need internet. All you need is a network. And you can use something like this simple travel router. This will let you set up a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, very easily, just like they're all connecting. You can also, you can also set up a, a Wi-Fi unit to be able to do this too. Most of them have the ability to do peer-to-peer. -peer. Not all of them do though, so you might want to check first on the particular unit. This will allow you to have connections between your computers, but no internet access. And you could, of course, feed this with a hotspot and give everyone on the network access if you did it that way. Field operations. Some of the considerations for field operations with a computer include the visibility of the screen in sunlight. I'm sure that many of you ran into this problem before. I, the first time I ran into it was 2010. I was operating field day from Cadillac Mountain in, Glacier, in Acadia National Park. And uh, I was the first site in the US to get sunlight uh, on field day because of the combination of the height and the distance east that I was at. But also it meant that I had great difficulty viewing the screen, the sunlight. I was out sitting on two rocks. One rock was my table, one rock was my uh, seat. So I ended up taking my blanket that I was sitting on and putting it over my head during the middle of the day so I could cover this, the, the screen and be able to see my screen to do logging. Another issue in the field is battery runtime. You're afraid you're gonna run out, especially when you're operating your radio battery powered, you need to be able to make sure your computer continues to run. One way to do that is having removable batteries, spare batteries. Uh, or a way to recharge your, your laptop in the field. One of the considerations is the voltage of the laptop. We'll talk more about that. And then also powering it via an external battery. So let's take a look at each of these. The visibility of screen in sunlight. Most laptops are washed out by sunlight. Working in a shelter or setting up a shield can be helpful. Also be aware of the other outdoor sun issues with your laptop. Overheating due to sun on the case or the outside temperature. Uh, most many laptops are black, not all of them, but a lot of them can absorb a lot of heat, so you might need to block the heat from hitting the outside of it. Moisture, not just rain, but high humidity can be a problem, and solar uh, solar uh, radiation can damage LCD screens if exposed for too long directly. There's some sunlight hacks available. The first one is to use a computer hood. And here's an example of a commercial computer hood you can buy on Amazon. It looks like a cardboard hood, but it's actually made out of some nice little plastic here. But you can also do a DIY cardboard or even better, a foam board uh, where it's, uh, you can have more durable. You can do improvised, as I did with a blanket over my head or a tarp, or you can throw part of your jacket over top of your head. So there are ways around that. 
Also, you might want to try wearing sunglasses. Sometimes if there's just glare on the screen, the sunglasses will take care of it and you can see the computer. Also, you might want to consider wearing darker clothes to avoid reflecting light onto the screen. So these are all ways that you can do that, but do count on the fact that you may need to be able to cover up part of the screen so you can see it. Battery runtime, in other words, how long the computer is going to run before the battery runs out. Uh, you can adjust the performance to power slider in the operating system. This allows you to adjust the computer to save power without performing at quite the same speed. And the speed is usually not an issue for all the programs you're going to be running for uh, amateur radio operations. Set the power saving options, the screen off time, the sleep settings, etc. to save power. Dim the screen output. That can save a considerable amount of power and actually make it easier to view sometimes uh, when you're out where it's bright. Uh, use a dark theme and wallpaper. Uh, I use a dark wallpaper all the time because I like it better. Turn off unneeded services. And this is very important. It's something you quite often forget. If you don't have Wi-Fi, turn off the Wi-Fi. Turn off Bluetooth. Turn off other things. Also turn off other software services that can make your CPU run more and run down your battery. In the old days, many laptops came with removable batteries. So you could have an extra two or three batteries handy. And it was just a matter of putting them on and taking one off, putting one on, taking one off. You'd have to shut the computer down, but that wasn't that much of a, a hassle as opposed to not being able to change the battery, which is now the case with most laptops. The batteries are built in. You can't get to them. If you have a non-removable battery and the laptop's a little bit old, consider replacing the battery if it's not holding, uh, if it's old and not holding a charge as previous. And you can buy the batteries fairly inexpensively. I can't guarantee how hard the job is. I would check on YouTube to see a teardown of your particular laptop. I've had laptops where changing the battery is a matter of taking two screws out of the back and opening a little door and plopping the new battery in. I've had other ones where it's required me to remove not only the back of the computer, but the keyboard and one of the operating boards. So make sure you check before you uh, jump in with the battery change. When you are buying the replacement battery, sometimes there's different uh, power uh, capabilities of batteries available. So you might want one that's a little more powerful for a long time. One of the questions with a laptop when you're buying it is what voltage is required? Most laptops, the power coming out of the charger going into the port on the side of the computer is anywhere from 18 to 24 volts. So you can't run it off your 12 volt battery that you're running your, your equipment off of uh, for your radio equipment. There are those some that operate on 12 volts and even some that operate on five volts. Some tablet keyboard style uh, laptops uh, use 5 volt DC and they can actually use a USB cable from a cell phone portable battery bank to run the radio I have to run the computer I have one that runs on 5 volts and I've been using it on FT8 and FT4 for quite a while it's a very it's a very modest laptop but it runs just fine and I can use cheap battery uh, cell phone battery portable packs with it and run it for the entire field day period if you're willing to do some internal mods to your laptop, you might be able to go in and find a place post battery. In other words, between the, the, where the battery gets fed the juice and after the battery, where you can power the laptop directly with 12 volts and you can put a 12 volt outlet on your laptop. This is definitely not for the faint of heart or the shaky of hand. And I will not guarantee that you will be able to pull this off. But in some cases, I've seen people do it. Now, Josh here from the Ham Radio Crash Course is saying, here's a 12 volt charging battery i'm charging laptop so you can charge this with your 12 volt battery the you the charger cable puts out 12 volts it's rather small this is the uh, same model that was available for 60 dollars at micro centers for a number of years by the way i have three extra ones here if anyone's still looking for one um, it's the evo and it works just fine it's not a real fabulous laptop but it works great and it's cheap and it does run off 12 volts which is a big advantage Unfortunately, of course, they use the coaxial power cable that's one of the tiniest ones, so soldering an end onto your uh, cable might be difficult, but you can still use your standard lead-acid batteries or your lithium phosphate batteries that you use for your radio equipment to power your laptop. What I've done over the years is I've actually went out and purchased a battery bank very similar to the one made for cell phones, but this is a much bigger one. It's about the size of a book, and it weighs a little bit more than a book but it basically has a lithium ferric uh, phosphate battery in it 
and it puts out 20 volts DC from this jack right here. You plug in the cable, and then there's an end adapter that fits on there to match the cable jack on your laptop. With this device, I can run my, uh, between charging my battery up ahead of time and this device, I can get a full 24 plus hours in the entire period of field day running my laptop off of this battery and the internal battery. Uh, I forget the exact brand that I have. This is the picture of the one that I have, but uh, it was not that expensive. Just make sure that when you're looking for one that it also c contains the adapters for your particular computer. Now, you can also do it by using the AC port of a what they refer to as a solar charger. These are basically big batteries that are designed to be charged from solar panels, but they can also be charged uh, from any other means with a charger. And then they put out a variety of voltages. Most of them have USB ports. They have 12 volt, but they don't have 20 volt ports on it. So what you're gonna need to do is use the inverter built in to feed your power supply for your laptop. Make sure when you're looking at one of these that it has a good sine wave output on the AC so it'll run your laptop just fine. You can also use a gasoline generator to feed the AC charger, but I don't feel comfortable with DC output generators plugging the feeding the DC directly into my laptop. In that case, I'd rather go through the, the power supply charger for my laptop, even though it's less efficient to do it that way, it's probably safer to do it that way. Now, one of the other uh, considerations for field use of radios is the possibility of multiple users. And this can happen in your shack also, not just in the field. So the, some of the considerations are setting up a specific user for all the programs, resources, your browser, et cetera. So make sure that whatever you're providing to the people, they can get to, because you can have multiple user accounts on the computer. And if you have some of the software set up in your account and some set up in a, in a separate user account, you'll run into problems. So make sure everything is set up for it, using one specific user that you're then gonna use for all your ham software and all your programs. Make sure users can log in with the password on the computer. Either don't put a password on it, or what I do is I put a sticker and I use a, a password like radio and I put it, the username and password right on the laptop so that in case the thing shuts down at night, they'll be able to restart it and put the password in. This is quite common. We did this, one group did this with our winter field day where they left the laptop there and it was working just fine because the person had signed in. Well, after the, they shut it down for a brief period of time when they changed the, when they filled the generator, they got it back up again and it asked for a password so they couldn't get in to continue operating. Uh, fingerprint and other access methods are not usable if you have multiple users. Don't forget passwords to log on to needed websites, networks, shared devices, etc. So either save, save these passwords with your browser or make sure the multiple users all have these available. So for example, if I want to use uh, qrz.com, I need to put the password in to be able to get the full information. Uh, they may also be required to log into things. Uh, so you need to make sure that they have that information for file storage or other things. Other considerations for multiple users. The biggest question is, will all the users be using one call sign for operation or will they be using their own individual call signs? And will that change over time? So if, let's say your club has a go box that you loan out to anyone that wants to use it in the club. When they take it home to their house, of course, you'd want them to use their call sign, not the club's call sign in most cases. So they would need to be able to change that for the software. You might also be doing something like a Poder operation where you have multiple users and they each want to use their own call sign when they're using that particular radio and computer. So you need to be aware of that uh, and know how each program works with the different call signs. Some programs have methods for setting up multiple profiles for different call signs. Others, you have to change it each time you want to use the program, which can be a pain. I have a little example here how to create an FT8, FT4 second user on the same Windows computer. And this is very much written for my local radio club and it has my name in it and other things. So um, you could ignore that aspect, but it basically tells you how to set up a second configuration of WSJTX. You might wanna do this for more than one reason. Let's say you have multiple users with different call signs using it, but the other reason why you might wanna do this is if you're using it with multiple radios, you can have multiple configurations with each configuration 
being a different radio in its settings and COM ports, etc. So this document is how to basically set up WSJTX with a second account on the same computer. Another possibility for multiple users is them not knowing what's going on. So I suggest that if you are going to create a shared laptop and or computer system such as a go box that you also create a notebook of documentation for that shared or long computer basically i call it a go box go box book because it has information about the go box itself telling them things like make sure you leave the case open when you're running the radio because it'll overheat in there if you have the case closed uh, information on the radio, including a manual of the radio. I, I usually provide a PDF manual on the computer that I'm sharing with it, but I might also have printouts from the manual. And any other equipment that might be attached, the antenna tuners, etc., uh, so that they know how to use the go box. Uh, this is more and more important as we go to digital communication for go box use. Where the radio is not the only part of the go box, but the computer that's designed and set up to work with the software that's being used and the radios that are being used in the go box all need to be integrated. So if you can design this book so that it can help that process, it can be extremely important in an emergency situation. I also include computer instructions, including which ports are connected to what on the radio. Uh, I even use stickers, so I'll put a sticker on a USB cable in market number one, and then I'll put a sticker on the edge of the computer next to the USB port and mark that number one, or I'll color code them or put A and B, etc. I'll also document that in the GoBox book exactly what is connected. So here's a little diagram from the GoBox book. I'll show it in a moment here. And then the third thing that's important to have is software program instructions. So if the person needs instructions on how to use the software they'll be there now most of the time they're going to need they're going to know how to use the software because they've already been trained but what the instructions are very important for is if a problem occurs or they need to make a configuration change let's say all of a sudden the radio dies and they need to use the computer on a different radio so now they need to go in and configure the com ports and the radio settings for that WSJTX or that VeraLink soft WinLink software so they need to have this information in the field so it's very important, the idea of a go box book. Whenever you think about building a go box, from the very beginning in the whole design process, start creating the go box, go box book. That's hard to say. So this is just an example of one I created for a local radio club. Uh, and I'm gonna zoom in on it a little bit here so you can see it better. But basically, please read all the information and especially the checklist and checklist, I think, are one of the most important things in the in the go box book. And I'll show you what I mean by checklist in a few minutes. I also have information on here. If you don't know what's going on, who to check with. Talk about different scenarios using the go box, whether it's for a club activity or whether it's being loaned out to a club member. I talk about the computer information. Things like don't change the other computer settings. Just because you like a certain background doesn't mean that we want it set that way. Um, also, a reminder that if you do change something, make sure you write down the original settings before you make the change so you can undo the problem you've just created by changing the settings. Uh, before returning the go box, go back and change any settings to the original settings. I talk about the different programs that are on there, WSJTX to run FT8, the logging software, the contesting software in 1MM, uh, the go box instructions. Now here's the first example of a checklist. This is a step-by-step -step checklist that they need to use when they open the go box. Make sure both the top and bottom covers are always open when operating. Attach the front panel to the front of the FT of the FT891 because we have it clipped off and they don't it doesn't fit in the go box with the panel on. Tells them how to connect the antenna, how to turn on the power supply. It tells them if they're using any of the software programs, make sure they turn on the radio before they power on the notebook computer. <coughs> have a diagram of the back of the radio because, of course, they can't see the back of the radio. So sometimes they just have to fill a run back there to plug a cable in. So it's great to have this little diagram. I've also went and put stickers on the top of the radio. You can't see it here. That actually, So when they're looking in at the radio, they have a marking that tells what each of the connectors is on the back. 
is on the top of the radio so they can see it without looking at the back of the radio. By the way, if you do get stuck, sometimes you can put your cell phone behind there and take a picture so you know what it looks like if the person wasn't nice enough to include this in the book. I also have instructions here telling them before they start the software, they need to make sure the following connections are in place. And then I have a diagram showing them how everything should look. You're welcome to take a look, <coughs> a look at this. Uh, this is another example. I have some of the, the, the quick manual information in here so they can do that describing the radio that they're going to be using i have so information on each of the pieces of software how it's configured how to use it <coughs> and so forth it's about 12 pages long you can go through use that as an example I also did a presentation for Rat Pack a little bit earlier, I think it was late last year, actually November, on uh, portable operations. And you might, the reason why I put this here is because I wanted to pull a couple things out of it for our field. Okay, go away. Oh, I know what the problem is. It doesn't like the fact that I zoomed in for the other document. There we go. Okay. So. I have an, a, a, a philosophy, whenever I'm operating portable, I do a special packing of my equipment. I set up the complete portable station, the rig, the power supply, the computer, all the interface cables, all the accessories I'm gonna use to a fully operating condition. I also connect it to an antenna and I make at least one or two contacts on each of the modes I'm gonna be using to make sure everything works. Preferably with the portable antenna, although sometimes I don't use the portable antenna, I use my own antenna just to, to make things a little quicker here. Once I do all this testing, I pack everything before I move anything. So basically my station is set up away from my operating shack on a, on a card table somewhere, and then I know that I have everything I need because I tested it all. I pack everything then. I also create a USB drive, which I always bring with me in addition to my computer. On this USB drive, I have enough information and materials that if something happened to my laptop, I could take any other person's laptop and install everything I need from this USB drive onto that laptop and use it with my computer, with my radio to complete my radio operation. So I have a full installation uh, file for the current version of the software I'm gonna be using. I have the latest update files. I have program documentation as a PDF file for all the different programs I'm going to be running. Now, one of the things you have to be careful of is you might say, well, I could just click on the help button on the top of the program. Some of those help systems are set up to take you out to an internet web page. And if you don't have internet access, all of a sudden you have no help. So make sure you go and download the PDF of the help file and keep it on your USB drive. I also have it on the computer, but I also have a backup on the USB drive. Don't count on updating or accessing live help via the internet. I also download under the USB drive some materials for my radio. I have the rig driver software, again, because if I need to use another computer, I'm going to need the driver software. I have the memory and utility software because I have a KX2 and a KX3. Uh, I need that if I need to change some settings. I have the radio operating manual as a PDF, and I also have some paper quick guides. As an example, I have one on the top of my go box here for my KX3 showing you the quick operations of it. I like the PDFs uh, on both, I like them on the computer better than on paper because I can actually search with the control F key quickly and find what I need as opposed to reading through the manual to find what I need. So I have all that in this little go box and if you're interested in that go box, I have another whole presentation on a rapid deployment go box using the KX3. And this is me operating in Delaware by the way outside the cabin for field day. Also on the USB drive, I have uh, all the information for the particular contest I'm gonna operate in or whatever event, whether it's a contest or something else. I have the rules as a PDF. I have multiplier maps or list. I usually do these on paper, but I also have a PDF version in case something would happen to my paper. Uh, I have a whole presentation, I'm not a presentation, but a whole document here for you to get your own materials that you can print out and or bring as PDFs. It's called Amateur Radio Charts and Maps, and it 
basically goes through and gives you access to a lot of different things that you can find on the internet if you search yourself but i have them all here in one place including like this little fold up uh band uh allocations thing that you can put into your wallet i have icoms band maps their grid square maps uh ham radio terms uh cq zone maps kenwood uh, band maps, technician class version, uh, region uh, IARU regions, uh, DX zones, uh, European grid squares, a US map. Then I have a bunch of them for my website, including this one I created that is the Canadian prefixes. This is the new version, by the way. Uh, so it isn't the one you want to use this week, but it's the new version because they're changing section names, if you haven't heard. There'll be no more Greater Toronto. It will now be the Golden Horseshoe. And uh, both Northwest Territory and Yukon will now be in the TER section. So they will be uh, one multiplier. And there's more stuff here. How to create an azimuthal map if you're going to be using a rotator, simplex frequencies for FM. And this is all available at tiny.cc slash chart dash maps. I actually put that in the chat here real quick. Okay, back to our originally scheduled program here. So I have that on the USB drive. I also have some accessories. I have the WinKey software. So if I have to determine what port the WinKey is on, I can't figure it out. I have my software for my USB um, I have my software for my USB GPS for time syncing. And if you need any other software set instructions, make sure you have them on the USB drive. I also use this BS USB drive after the event to copy all of my log on to. So my log is on my computer, but if something would happen to my computer between the time I leave my event, when I get back to my house, I also have all the information on the USB drive. Make sure you keep updating that all the time. I also like to go through and print out a quick directory of everything that's on the USB drive so I can know if I have the things I need on there. And there's different tools that you can use uh, that you can find on Windows uh, to be able to print out directories from a USB drive, including the different layers of directory. So what I want to talk about next uh, are some online resource categories. And I'm going to have to go a little bit quicker here because I'm running out of time because I didn't realize this one was going to be as long. Everything I'm going to show you is on my website, kzt.com. And I'm actually going to go through these on the website to show you there live. So we'll get to the end of these. Okay. So let's go out to kzt.com. The person I used to work with used to call me the web, web resource hoarder because I'd always have all these websites with different stuff on it. So when you go to kzt.com, if you go up here to the top to news, there's a whole bunch of information on news, blogs, amateur radio resources, calendars, etc. And you can click on any of these little pictures. These are all buttons to bring up resources. I have another section on maps and charts, uh, even more that's, than that's on that one page I showed you. Uh, I have contesting page including contesting software in addition to the usual things like n1mm and things that people already have i have a bunch of add-ons for n1mm including one that i know that the the author is now deceased and i think i'm the only place that has the athena for n1mm hosted on my site so if you want that analyzation software for n1mm you can get it from my contesting page uh, i also have a whole page on n1mm material because i use it a lot uh, I have one on propagation and spotting, including all different types of DX, DX clusters, reverse beacon networks, beacons, uh, propagation tools, uh, all available on one page. A whole page on digital modes, FT8, FT4, PSK, RIDI, uh, even some packet stuff on there. Have another one on QRP and low power operations. Uh, logging and QSLing, including a variety of logging software for both Windows and for Linux and Macintosh. 
free programs and commercial programs. Also, I have a little thing here where you can see that if you worked me recently, if you worked me, you can do a log search from here. Uh, another section on amateur radio software. These are a variety of different programs for different purposes, and I have most of them linked here. These are all software that you can download. Uh, space and satellites, including places that you can download software, or you can go online and track using a website such as uh, N2YO or Heaven Above. You can do your satellite tracking right there without having to install any software. It's OS independent, so you don't have to worry about that. I have another section on rules and operating uh, that includes a whole bunch of things like band plan, written descriptions, uh, frequency list, uh, clip, a CEPT chart for knowing when the, the reciprocal licensing, worldwide information on amateur radio licensing for different countries, a whole bunch of stuff from the AWRL, IARU, RSGB, and other organizations around the country, world. A section on awards and QSLing, uh, information on vanity call signs, uh, emergency and public service. I also have a section on radios and technology. This has a link for each of the different mod brands of radio. So you can go to Ellacraft, for example. I have some links for that. I have links for Yesu, Icom, Kenwood, Tentech. I also have a presentation called The Odyssey of the Argonauts. If you're a Tentech person, you're going to want to go out and view this slideshow and also look up my recording of the video for it. I then have a section called uh, on youth for amateur radio with a number of resources. And in addition, I also have a kids site. This is on a different page. This is on uh, this is the kids amateur radio site uh, that has a bunch of resources for kids, including all the Zach and Max comic books, both the color versions and the black and white coloring book versions. If you get tired of all that, I have a whole section on food and eating and cooking. I have one on railroads and trains, which have nothing to do with the amateur radio presentation tonight, but uh, that's all available there. So that's my website. What we don't have time for tonight is to go into individual computer programs that I use, but maybe we can do that another night. So again, this is the uh, QR code you can scan, or you can put in this link and get access to the slideshow presentation today. In addition, my contact information again, and I also have a spreadsheet of all my presentations that look suspiciously like the Rat Pack one because I did both of them. These are all the presentations I have available. And if you're interested in a presentation from that list for your local club, or if you need something different, just contact me and I'd be happy to do a live or Zoom present a live Zoom or in person if you're close by presentation for your club. I'm trying to work uh, present all states. I've got about 35 states and three countries, so. I'd be happy to do one for your local club. So again, I'll leave that on the screen for a few seconds. And I will take any questions we might have. I'm going to go ahead and stop the share on the screen on the share. By the way, you can tell when someone has monitor multiple monitors when they're doing Zoom because they'll keep swinging their eyes around. Okay, so this is it right here. So this is the one I use. It's called VB Audio Software, but there are other ones available. Okay. Make sure there wasn't anything else at the top of the chat here. I think that's... Oh, yes, Dan brought up a question, uh, a statement. You can control when your Windows updates. So what I would suggest is when you're operating the field, if you do have Internet access, even if you don't, turn off your Windows updates so they won't try, it won't try and update the computer. Do the same thing with your virus settings so that when you're trying to operate in the field, you won't have that come up, especially when you, you know, you're learning the computer to someone else or you're working with a group of people. Nothing's more frustrating than to have the computer want to, shut down and do a restart with a with an update uh and uh nice thanks to see you jim i i did drop a line on the long island cw club and jim up from there uh showed up with us tonight so i know we have a few new faces i'm always happy to see that i know dan likes that also other questions comments uh, anthony uh thank you for uh the especially for the part uh, toward the beginning on ports 
that's something that I'm uh, uh, struggling with at the moment. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And that's 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 one of the things that I I, I know that a lot of hams struggle with. Uh, for a while, I did home computer consulting uh, back in the 90s and early 2000s. And it was funny, I probably re reinstalled more modems, reinstalled more CD-ROM drives, reinstalled more mics because people didn't understand how COM ports work. That was the number one thing. And that was back in the old days when you had four COM ports to choose from and that was it and everything was uh, confusing. So COM ports have always been an issue. But Bob, N6TV, does a great job in that presentation. By the way, all the presentations from contact university from 2021 back through 2013 are all available for you to watch for free other questions comments well i'll comment for somebody that i was given five minutes to put this together you did a heck of a good job but you gave me three hours you did you, you called me we talked at four and i had it ready at seven that that's true. <laughs> Miracles. I, I, had to, I had to apologize. I found a couple mistakes as I was going through, and I didn't have as many little pictures in there I'd like to have. So I'll I'll keep tweaking this. Ah man, this has been a great presentation, especially especially given the situation where it had to throw it together so fast. Very appreciate you. Oh, you're very welcome. I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Uh, I, I can even demonstrate a couple things. If you, let me just bring up the screen share for a second. I'll demonstrate a couple things real quick. I gotta move this around. This is a program by W by VA2. Let me bring up the share here. So this is the program I'm using to share my COM ports with. It's called uh, K34, uh, K3, Win for K3 Suite, and it's by VA2 FSQ, and it works really slick. What I basically do is I go in here and I put in, okay, what's, what's monitor? This is the, this is one of the problems with monitors when things pop up on screens and you don't know what monitor it's on. Nope, didn't get the right one. Okay, I gotta go find where that's hiding at. It's not gonna let me see where it's hiding. I think it's on the third monitor, which is turned off. I'm sorry about this. But basically, it lets me set up the ports so that I'm sharing the ports so I can run my WSJTX is running on this port. My logging software is running on this port. I just found where this was hiding. I'm dragging it from one monitor to another so you'll see it come into the screen here. This is the setting. So what you do is you go in and you set up what the COM port of the actual radio is, and then you connect to it. Once you do that, you go in here under this third-party software button, and you set up COM ports that you've already pre-configured with the COM0, COM0 as a pair. So I have 15 and, I have 15 and 17, 16 and 18, 19 and 21, etc. You click on the connect button and it connects it. So that means that that original port is now port 15, port 16, port 19, port 23, point 15, and point 15. If I connected those, I have them the last two connected. So I have four COM ports being shared, uh, four fake com ports basically that are being shared by the software so they can all use the k3 at the same time so if i change my frequency in any of these it will automatically change it on my radio and so forth <clears throat> 